One, two, three, four, five. Welcome back to the TMCJ Podcast. We are in episode 49. Uh, I don't know, 7 times 7, 49. It's one of those fun numbers. But 49 is a nice number. I do like the number 49. Mm, not quite as good as 69, though. No. Now, we have, we actually have, uh, again, a ton to talk about. We've been going over two hours for like the last few podcasts. We'll see if we can keep it to a more reasonable length at this one. Yeah. Um, but to start well, it with, tends to be like we, we, we keep it fairly short on two of them. And we're like, oh, okay, we've done really well. And then on the last one, we yeah, just we'll go, go crazy way over. overboard. Yeah. Well, we had two two in a row that was a book <laughs> review. And then last time we did a quiz. And that one was pretty long, too. Yeah. Oh, well, next week, we'll have time for the, the second book review of, of the series. Yeah, I'll have to see how much I remember. Because I'm already reading the third book. Yeah, fucking powering through that shit. It's really good, you were right. Anyway, mm. uh, <laughs> to not, not to dwell on that. Uh, so at time of recording, it is July third. So the whole Pride Month thing is over, and um, mm. we have a couple topics that, as I just for lack of a better term, I guess we're going to assess the damage. Like it's there's there's it's always a mixed bag with this because there's there's good stuff that comes out of it. Like you know, obviously the whole you know tolerance acceptance people being happy who they are, living their life, yep. and all that. But then there's always the people who go and take it a little bit too far. So, yep. I'm going to start with that, and then I know yep. we'll, we'll save the funny me. one for... Actually, yeah, 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 absolutely. I agree. So, the, the one that I'm <laughs> thinking of is, uh, it's been floating around, and I've seen a couple different, like, um, kind of news-oriented people on YouTube talking about this. And yep. I actually went and read the article. The Washington Post put out an article, but I think she's like a freelance writer or journalist. Yeah. And she was making the argument for why, um, like, more kinky stuff belongs at these pride parades. And again, you know, maybe it does. I I don't know. It's not <laughs> it's not my area of expertise. But the uh, thing that is disturbing people is that she yep. was talking about bringing her extremely young children to it. And, like... It, did she actually bring her children to it? Her children. She brought her she toddler okay. and her elementary schooler. Um, for those outside yeah. the U.S., that's a kid somewhere, like, probably seven, eight-ish years old. Um, and was talking about how uh, she was trying to explain, or she was happily explaining to them about, like, well, a big hairy man in a leather thong was spanking another man or something like that on a float. And the toddler was giggling at it, and the elementary schooler was questioning it, and she was like, oh, they're just being themselves, or something like that. And I'm just like, A, I, I, I get it, some people are into that stuff. I mean, but keep it in the bedroom. Seriously. Yeah. There's, like, so I was, I was thinking about this actually quite a bit last night, hmm. and I, I came to the conclusion that as a journalist, she was absolutely fine, she was doing the right thing, she was coming up with a good article, right? Yeah. That's fine and great. As a mother, I think she kind of failed in that you should not be exposing your children to something like that, in my opinion, um, at that age. Yeah, and uh, you're right, she, she did the right thing as a journalist, she got a ton of uh, traffic for the Washington Post, there's definitely a lot of mm -hmm. people who read that, and mostly it's, you know, rage clicks, but... Yeah, they did read yeah. it. And strong opinions on either side. Like, there's there's not going to be anyone really in the middle, I don't think, too much. No, and, but the thing, the thing that was kind of um, interesting about it, she obviously did a lot of self-promotion on various social media sites, and a good chunk of the comments and responses to what she put out, even from people who are, like, deeply into, like, pride, they're, they're like... No, don't do this. This is this is like horrible optics for us. Like this is not like that yeah. sort of stuff. Not for kids. Keep them out of this. Like, it's it's fine. Like, and it's not like um, like public signs of affection, right? Holding hands, kissing, hugging yep. in public. Nothing wrong with that. Like, no, I think that's fine. Like, especially. But don't get me wrong, I don't want to see someone like making out hardcore on a park bench when I'm trying to have a nice stroll, but. Even, like, the, yeah, the but peck on the cheek, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but even even hardcore making out and stuff, like, in public, it's, there's nothing illegal about it. Yeah, it might be kind of... It might be something you don't want to see. Maybe it's a... Uh, yeah. But it's... I think if there are kids around, again, you should just kind of turn yeah, it back a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah, Which I, I think kids should be allowed to go to Pride. I think absolutely that they well, they should. Th this was a point I was making. Um, I was talking this was a, a while back. I was talking to my 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 parents about it because they had seen something on the news about this, and I was like, "Yeah, that like that's that is the route towards like having this just be completely totally mainstream and accepted." Is if it can be like an like if it can be something that like seen as a family event, right? Yeah, like a summer fair. Yeah, exactly. That sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Like a fair or a festival, that sort of stuff. Mm. But, like, the overt sexuality of a lot of the, uh, the stuff in some of the more extreme ones. I'm looking at you, California. Um, <laughs> that That's... You, I'm sorry. It's just... It's wrong to bring kids to that. That's abuse, in my opinion. Um, yeah, to expose I, I know, kids to well, that, to expose but... kids to things that are overtly sexual, especially young children, I think that is abusive. Yeah, I think if you went to it and not realizing that people do, people do turn up in that kind of because so I've I've being pansexual myself, uh, and having gone to a couple of pride parades in my time, mm. not recently to be fair, but um. Yeah, I remember one of the things that was kind of shocking to me, and all the friends that I was with at the time who were with me, was that there was someone wearing, you know, the kind of fucking dog outfit. And I fucking hated that, by the way. Um, and we're not talking, like, furries. We're talking leather and shit, which is just... Oh, God, it creeps me out. But whatever, if it's your kink, that's fine. Just keep it in private in your bedroom What's the, does the, and, and if it's if you like going out doing like events for stuff like that and other people like going to events and stuff like that fine have an event with for stuff yeah, like have that an but, event have it, for but have it, it be 18 plus exactly uh, and not like in the middle of the city center you know where even just passes by just you know like yeah. confused um, also I don't know another thing I was thinking about last night and this is going to go a bit Maybe a bit deeper, but um, is I, I don't know. I feel like these days there is nothing prideful about pride. What what? Okay, something that I would consider prideful or to be proud of is if you live in an area where no one accepts you for no one accepts gay people. For yeah. example, I think coming out in a place like that or just being gay in a place like that, even without coming out, I think that you, you should be proud that you have the the sheer nuts on you to, to fucking be yourself. And I am absolutely 100% behind that. But apart from that, I can't, off the top of my head, think of any reason that I would be proud of being who I am. In the same way that I'm not proud that I have two arms and two legs, I just am. Yeah. That's that. I mean, in in a lot of ways, that that line of thinking is a sign of like, um, you know, how far a lot of places in the West at least have come. Because, especially in California, like, it's almost weird if you're not gay. Hmm. It's like I don't know. We could go down that rabbit hole. We quite could go far, down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but without dwelling on it too long, I think that the one thing that everyone on kind of both sides of this kind of coagulated on or um coagulated uh <laughs> no it works it's a weird word it but is, it works but yeah i know it worked but it's, it's very <laughs> medical anyway they um i know the, they, they came together around the idea that like you know whatever you thought about the rest of what the, the woman said in the article the fact that she was perfectly okay and encouraging people to bring their kids to the kinky stuff was just yeah. wrong kind of. on so many levels. Yeah. Anyway. And I'm all for teaching kids about like life and future, well, but, but there's some things that you need to be a certain age for. Yeah, exactly. And like, you're, seven you're not, is way too fucking you're young. You're not going to have the birds and the bees talk with a five-year-old. Exactly. Or, That's or, the time to have the conversation. Yeah, exactly. You, you do it when they're like they're getting close to puberty, and you're you know it's like you need to prepare them as a parent. Like, yeah, for that's weird the stuff. Time. And you don't do it by showing them a big hairy man spanking another one in the street. Yeah, I'm surprised that was allowed on the the parade itself. To be honest, like that stuff tends oh, to be like 
there's been much worse than the California ones, especially uh. the, I think San Francisco is the is the worst of all. Like there's been full on like taco making going on, like on the floor. Fucking hell. Jesus. Um. So that that's one of the yeah. <laughs> With so that that's the the more serious. Anyway, one. another pride news. <laughs> Let's bring us to one of the funnier <laughs> ones. In the in your case, it's uh you know corporations being, well. Dumbasses. Corporations being dumbass. Well, okay, yes, because it is a corporation. It's, um, it's, so it's, I was. Yeah, they're, they're trying to make <gasps> a quick buck. Okay, let me bring you a small tale <laughs> of last night. Kaiser and I were playing a fun little game of Heroes of the Storm. <laughs> when all of a sudden, Blue had a fantastic recollection that football is gay. <laughs> I wasn't That's the new sign from NFL. Sign? New slogan commercial, from yeah. NFL. Yep. There are, <laughs> the commercial literally has on the screen, football is gay. Um, <laughs> and I thought he was exaggerating. <laughs> like, I didn't understand. Like, I, I, it literally is just a black screen with plain white text that says, football is gay. Yeah, and then football is lesbian. Football is everyone. Football is America. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't speak for a solid like thirty seconds. I was laughing so hard because <laughs> it just it sounds so it's stupid. So stupid, yeah. <laughs> like it's like I get it. They're going, they're going like yeah, you know. It's I, I don't even know what they're doing. Do they think like <laughs> I just can't man. wait for like the the fucking government to put out. Taxes are gay. Hey, I'll go <laughs> Tax office now supports gay rights, so pro- taxes are gay. I, I wouldn't put it past. They probably already have done something like that. If you pay your taxes, you are homosexual. I just... <laughs> oh, my God. I just... I don't know what they were going for. With, like, other than just somebody... So, it was... Go on. I just think somebody in the marketing department had too much time and too much money. Yeah. So it was a big, uh, it was, well, I say a big, I don't know how large, or if they've even done anything about it apart from just say the words, but it was a campaign from NFL um, to support gay rights, which is great on the face of it, but at the same time, it's kind of like nothing really to do with gay rights. What? But the other thing is, so I know, um, uh, to. I know, my, like, my my dad's a huge fan of sports. Like, I used to be able to tell what season it was by what sport was on TV in the house. Yeah. Like, you know, hockey, football, golf, baseball, like, just... A whole bunch of them. Sport yeah. for every season. And I know, <laughs> I know that he does, isn't a huge fan of, like, um, like the, 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 the sports commentators in general. Um, like, he just likes watching the games. And I just, mm. he does, he's not a fan of, like, the... Uh, the commentators getting into politics either and i feel like that's that's the oh, yeah. a lot of people who are fans of sports they just want to watch sports like they don't yeah wanna... i remember sorry no it's it, but i think it's the same thing and i think it's the same thing whether you you know gay straight bi, whatever like if you like mm. football you like you're just gonna you're gonna watch football and you want to watch the football you don't need them coming up and going like don't worry gay people you can watch football it's just... I, mean, I remember I watched a video on uh, a couple of commentators who were unhappy that they did flyovers on every game. Um, like, it, it's kind of a... Uh, there's people on either side of it, but at the end of the day, it's a bit of fun, a bit of tradition. Yeah. You know. Who cares? It's cool. It's like, we, don't, we don't really need to have this debate before a game. <laughs> and the other thing is... By that same logic, we don't need the game at all. Like, why do they do the flyovers? Because it's cool and it's entertaining. Why? Why do we have the game? Because yeah. it's cool and it's entertaining. <laughs> but it costs so much money, <laughs> and it pays us, and we charge so much money. Hang on a second. <laughs> oh, it's just so. Oh God. Uh, but yeah, no, just the. the, the game. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure they lost a lot of viewers with that, to be honest. <laughs> um, 
and they shouldn't have. But at the end of the day, you gotta just think about your. It's just your audience is well, not gonna. That's the other thing. Like, just why? <laughs> Why did they? It's like that um, that Gillette ad that caused a whole bunch of people to get pissy a couple of years back. Oh, the fucking the men. Yeah, the, the the men. The Gillette is like, who's our primary audience? Oh, men. Let's tell them all that they're horrible, abusive fucks. Yeah, don't be misogynistic. Uh, and this is like the same company that in their adverts previously they had been like, you know, be a man. <laughs> And now exactly. they're like, don't be a man. <laughs> You're sending me mixed messages, uh, Razor Company. Can you please just show me or like sell me like shaving equipment? Yeah. But uh, it does kind of seem like in both those examples, these examples that companies now have genders or sexualities. It seems. Yeah, it's more that I think. So previously, right, a, a company's sole purpose like the idea behind them it, it almost feels like every company is trying to have like a moral cause like or to mm. to, to like get get out there and do I, my company's doing this too and I, it just it baffles me i'm like like we need to make the world a better place i'm like we're making a drug that saves people's lives we're already making the world a better place can you just shut up and stop wasting money on this shit well yeah, we get they, they've got to broaden their horizon the whole time otherwise there wouldn't be a whole branch of the business that, you know, that they're all about bringing in new customers, so, I mean, they have to look for some places. Yeah, I, I, I get that, but... And also, supporting gays are so rife. Like, it's just something that so many companies do now that it's an easy go-to. Yeah, um, but by that same token, like, you'd think people in marketing would realize this, it's just becoming white noise. Like, if everyone's doing it, you're not going to be standing out doing it. So you're not going to be oh, getting yeah. any new customers. But it's like it's like Comic Sans, right? When Comic Sans first came out, mm. everyone used it. And I'm talking from kids' birthday parties to literal gravestones had Comic Sans on it. <laughs> I didn't know they used it on gravestones. <laughs> yeah, they used it everywhere. Um, and now everyone... It's kind of a jokey thing that everyone's fucking sick of. And... I feel like that's where these same, all these trends eventually end up. Mm. Um, I feel like this is a lot. This is obviously a lot more serious than just using a childish like font. Yeah. So maybe it's not going to be a joke. Maybe it's just going to be a depressing thing that everyone overused to death, and no one has any actual real meaning behind it. But that is the worry behind all yeah. this: is if people get really really sick of this if they start to take it out on the people these companies are ostensibly trying to support yeah it's gonna get the other way yeah but yeah so anyway <laughs> moving on that was a, a little little segment for that <laughs> all right so this was a, a fun little thought experiment um that i i had completely going away from well not entirely from modern day politics or but mm. it is it, it ties to uh, modern day and uh, modern day industry, I should say. Um, <clears throat> I was talking with uh, Juan and Raymond uh, yesterday, and yep. I, I I thought of this interesting metaphor because obviously a, a big thing that's going on right now is these big like tech giant companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft. And they kind of have... Yeah, I'm trying to get hired by, yeah. <laughs> they try to have, like, these... Like they, Don't fuck my chances, Kaiser. No, just, Don't say they're all terrible. I'm not. Um, I do think that social media is unhealthy for you. I think people do abuse it. But I don't think there's anything yeah. inherently wrong with the companies. Um, anyways, they obviously have, like, global reach, a lot of power, a lot of money. And they, they have massive, like, market share in whatever industry they happen to be in. Yeah. And... Now there's a ton of governments around the world that are trying to find ways to fuck them. Like they're going, like they're trying to go, like, oh, Facebook's a monopoly. Uh, the summit over. Oh God, it's definitely not. The G7 summit. Well, in it, it that that did get shot down in court. Um, but there's so many social media sites they're, as they're big talking, as Facebook. Yeah, but they're talking about how uh, to put. Um, putting like a global like 15% tax on all social media companies or all tech companies because they they use several uh, legal tax holes to move money and not be charged for it not be taxed by any any local government 
uh, specifically yeah. the Netherlands and Ireland. There's a loophole that if you move money between the U.S., Netherlands, Ireland, you actually can get close to a 0% tax rate in all three countries. Uh, anyway, th that's unimportant. But I was thinking that they, they actually have a very close resemblance to uh, the historical institution of like the, uh, the Knights Templar. Um, right. Like not a lot. Bear of in mind, the most I know about Knights Templar is from Assassin's Creed. Just which, so like, you know, I know, I know. That's why I'm going to, I'm going to go over exactly why I'm drawing this comparison because I'm, I'm imagining okay. a good, you know, our audience probably doesn't know much about them either, um, or who knows, maybe they do. But they were an organization, uh, like a Brotherhood of Knights, that was formed to protect pilgrims and travelers who went to the Holy Land during the Crusades in medieval times. So from Europe to Jerusalem. And part of what they started to do was to, you know, offer banking services to those travelers. So, like, if somebody made a deposit with a knight in Europe, they could withdraw in the Holy Land so they didn't have to bring money with them. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa, if they had money back in the Holy Land, they could go back to Europe and not have to do it. So they, they created one of the most, like, complex and efficient and well-organized banking services that had ever existed in Europe up to that point, um, barring maybe the Romans. Mm. And they, they amassed like huge amounts of wealth and power throughout Europe uh, until it got to the point where the king of France was like, you know what, I don't like owing people money. And then he did this massive purge. He accused them of heresy and all this other stuff and just wiped them wiped them out in Europe. And they, they ceased to be a, a functioning organization uh, mm. in most of Europe. I think the only place they survived was uh, Switzerland, um, which ironically has some of the best banking services in the world. <laughs> um, they, But th that, that kind of comparison like jumped out to me is they came up with a revolutionary technology, amassed a ton of wealth, and then basically all of Europe, the whole world at that point, tried to take them down. Um, yeah. And now you've got these tech companies, revolutionary new technology, amassed tons of wealth, and now all the governments on Earth are trying to take them down. Um, mm. And I was just, I was curious what your thoughts are on that comparison. Uh, well, I, I, I can't say I have any love lost for Facebook. Um, I think, I, I agree with you, I think Facebook does breed hatred, essentially. Yeah. Um, it was all right back in the day, kind of, when it was more of a thing just to reach out to friends you hadn't seen in a long time. Mm. Um, but, I mean, I think Twitter's just... There's there's so many vile people on there. There's also really nice people, don't get me wrong, but the nice people don't get heard because people are, go on there and they upvote the, or downvote the things that are just atrocious. Um, which makes it great for if you're going to go on there and just laugh at the world for a little bit. But it's not a friendly place. It's not saying I, when I ever have kids, I'm not going to be like, you, I'm going to say you can't have Twitter kind of thing. Because yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, not, it's not a positive thing. And it takes up, you know, 10 minutes of your life each week or whatever. And... Um, yeah, so I don't think it's a good product. I think the business is a great business because they it works and it makes a lot of money for them. Good for them. It's making jobs. Mm. But from a client, like from a, a end user point of view, I, I think it's kind of these social media sites are just crap. <laughs> they that's the thing. Like, it'd be one thing if yeah, if people did use them and somewhat in moderation i i used to have well I, I still technically have a facebook account but i i haven't logged into it in more than a year um mm. twitter i had i had an account for about six months and it was probably the least productive six months in my adult life mm. like i just it, it just because it, he it's so easy to just you know scroll through it and just not just read random shit and not do anything else. Yeah, when well, you wake up in the morning, you just sit up in bed scrolling through Instagram or Snapchat. Well, not Snapchat, but... Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, it does just... And what you said about, like, Facebook kind of breeding hatred, that's sort of by design. Um, mm. 
mm. but not in the way like not in any sort of malicious way the the algorithms that they use to actually get engagement like to show you things that you might want to see it it ch like basically they they track what will get you to click on something comment on something do whatever right and they found well not they found it's it's an ai algorithm so it'll just it'll it'll just show you more of what you engage with the most and they found people engage the most with well things they hate or things that make them angry yeah um, they they would engage with things they liked but they're more likely to engage with things that they hate uh and so it it's sort of just it keeps showing you things that you hate because they knows that's what you'll go with and i i encountered yeah. this on facebook i found that every time i was logging in i was just getting more and more angry and that's one of the reasons that I just stopped using it. Yeah. That and, I don't know, maybe it's because the, the generation that I was in when I was using Facebook, so quite a few years ago, but it seemed to be just... I don't know, <laughs> it's going to sound really horrible. I, I don't want to see just everyone... everyone I knew at school. Like... I didn't like 90% probably of the people. Ah, that's probably a bit much. When you're at school, you just add everyone. And then mm. for years afterwards, you just get like, been on holiday in Barbados. It's been great. I've been sleeping with women and drinking a lot of alcohol. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to see that. I don't care about this person. And I'm annoyed that they're having a better life than I am. <laughs> <laughs> they, actually, that's, that's a good point. So, um psychological impact they've uh I, I was what was i reading the other day uh fuck i can't remember um so some of the we were talking about like long form videos on youtube things that you know occasionally it's just you put it on if it's something to listen to in the background there's one that i yeah. follow um she's a she's got a doctorate in some some sort of social science i don't remember what it is exactly yeah. but the person goes through very like comes up with an idea comes up with a point and then goes through various scientific studies you know and and quotes them and tries to draw some kind of a conclusion and mm. um one of them was around social media and they were talking about um how that was causing people to go through like depression because they would go on social media sites and of course the things you post on social media are just like the best bits of your life it's like oh i'm on vacation look at these beautiful pictures you don't go like oh you know i slept in until noon and then like you know didn't get dressed all day you don't post pictures and post about that you just you do about the good yeah. stuff and so people were seeing all their friends and it gave them the false psychological impression their friends were living these amazing awesome lives and their normal life wasn't that good uh even though that might Ooh, not be like there's two ends to that spectrum, though, because people either post that they're having the best lives ever, or they're, like, they really big up how fucking hard their life is. Yeah. And then, I don't know, whenever I read something that's... If someone sends me a private message about them having a tough time, I will always take it 100% seriously. <coughs> if someone puts it on a, like, public forum, I am always a lot more dubious from the start, because... You don't get help from public forums, typically. Unless it's a forum specifically designed yeah. to help people. If it's just a bunch of random yahoos out in the world you're putting it out to, it sounds more like an attention grab, in my opinion. It is. I'll, I'll come um, around and say, I think it is. Now, I mean, the, the sad truth is there probably are people out there that don't have anyone they can talk to directly either in person or online and maybe that's they're they're doing that just to try and like find somebody but i think in the majority of cases that's not true it's just somebody's out there looking for attention yeah uh, but anyway if we weren't we weren't intending to go into a, a long <laughs> attack on that um yeah we've got like a few minutes left we want to mention our way <laughs> the nosy <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, we so this is gonna be coming out soon. We we started playing a doing a co-op playthrough of a way out. It's a it's a co-op video game 
where it's actually kind of cool the way they did it. You're playing two different characters, but and you're playing in two different areas, but you're doing it simultaneously, so it's always split screen mm. there. So yeah, split screen. It's a lot. It's very couch co-op-y. Yeah, I, which is something I miss. I used to love playing like you know mm. co-op games with friends in the same location. Um, but yeah, it's 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 actually kind of fun. One of the characters has like the largest nose I think I've ever seen. It's one of the few yeah. objects visible from the moon. Um, <laughs> it's one of the, the new great wonders of the world. Uh. There's some um, full frontal nudity that I was not expecting to have to edit out. Um, yeah, and a lot of full back nudity. <laughs> um, a lot we we that, spent, that ass. but it is it is a fun fun game and it was it was surprisingly entertaining. It is. Um, it's one of those games where they got the co-op right. They weren't just yeah. like, it's a co-op game so people will enjoy it. They put in a really good story, and then they added the fact that it's co-op on top of that, and it yeah. becomes a really good game. And it's really, it, it seems to have been built around co-op. Um, yeah. Just to give it people an idea of the premise, it's some probably in the 30s, 40s, 50s in the US, two guys got are in prison and they're trying to escape prison um one guy's a bit of a hothead one guy's a banker um a, a banker and a murderer are they oh yeah banker and murderer we, we still <laughs> don't know what happened maybe he maybe it's false yeah. maybe he didn't actually murder anyone we don't know what they've got to do with harvey harvey yeah some guy harvey. named harvey is trying to sick other prisoners on them and kill them yeah um but anyway, we shouldn't talk about it too much because it's a it's a video on the channel. Check it out if yeah. it sounds interesting to you. It's a prison co-op game. Depending uh, on depending on how quickly I edit it, it may or may not be up by the time this is. Ah, okay. Well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Keep an eye out for it. Um, maybe who knows? Maybe it'll be as good as the old um, We Were Here series, really like classic co-op that we both loved. Yeah, we beat all those games. Yeah. All right. That's all that we had to talk about, really. Anything? Any mm -hmm. final thoughts? Uh, we're gonna have to cram a lot into segment two, so look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got to save time here. All right, this is gonna be the end of segment one of the TMCJ podcast. Thank you all for listening, and you will hear us again momentarily for segment two. Welcome back to the TMCJ Podcast. We are on segment two, our media segment, and this week we did movie night for the first time in quite a while, actually. Uh, and it is a movie that is a classic, a favorite of mine. I think I first saw it when I was like maybe 12 or 13. It came out when I was quite young, but um, it was uh, the, the Last Samurai. Uh, mm. Got... Tom Cruise in it, and a bunch of other actors that I... Oh, uh, Ken Watanabe, he's, like, a Japanese actor that I've seen in a few... Th everything I've seen him in, I, I think I've liked. But this was the first thing. The, the British photographer guy, I recognize him from, like, Harry Potter and stuff. Is that where he's from? Okay, I've, I've definitely seen him he's, before in things. I just couldn't place him. Uh, I want to call... He's, he's Scabbers, the rat. I can't remember what his name was. Oh, um, that's right, yeah. Yep, Okay. Yeah. yeah, that would have been quite a, few. Yeah, quite a few years later. Um, but yeah, no, The Last Samurai, holy crap, that was a really cool movie. Yeah, and I didn't... But... I, <laughs> when you were asking how, how long it was, and I um, I looked at the back of the... Because I have it on DVD, and I looked and it was like 156 minutes. I didn't think it was that long. And when you watch it, it really does just kind of fly by. Like, it doesn't seem like a, it drags on at any point. Mm. Um, but because it's kind of a long movie, what I thought I, I would do is just kind of go through the movie and um, just we can stop at various points to chat about it. Um, yeah, go for it. One no, okay, I, before that, though, there's something that happened throughout the film which kind of mm. I was unsure about. Okay. Go ahead. I understood that the proper form when you're bowing on your knees is to keep your face forward and like have the neck basically protected so someone can't just cut the back of your fucking neck. Sometimes they did it, 
but in like the point where the 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 big dude dies in the field, mm. all of those people are like face to the ground. Yeah, I think the difference is, and I don't, I I'm not positive, but that's how you do the um, like. There's a difference between like a a polite bow and what is colloquially called kowtowing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what they were doing. Like, not kowtowing is is something that you're supposed to do for the Chinese emperor, but I think that um, for the Japanese, there might be something similar. Like, if it's just like you, you don't do that 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 thing because it's just you're a hundred percent. You're there to um, like you're essentially. I, I don't, but the, the 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 general dude, yeah. the the awesome samurai general, yeah. He when he bowed to the emperor, he did it in what I thought was the proper way, where you're like facing the person. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that it was different because the the times where that happened, like it was always in some kind of a conversation. It was always like a you know. Uh... Wait, what's the... there's a word I'm looking for and I cannot think of it. It's polite, like it's just it's yeah. it's. Fuck, I can't think of the word. Basically, something you do in civilized conversation, right? There's a different... Respectful. Yeah, respect. Thank you. God. And um, that where that at the end there, I think that's almost like in a worshipping kind of way. Like, it's not part of the same polite ritual that you have during conversation. It's like you are just deeply honored to be in the presence of this, this person. It's It's almost like a... That that was my always my impression is that like they they're just showing like the deepest form of like you know respect for that person. Okay. But I don't know. I don't know. And I I I have no expertise on this topic. I'm just kind of guessing on that. But I never mm. picked up on that, so that's interesting. Um. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the the film was very largely Hollywoodized. Hmm. Um. Something that probably the thing that annoyed me most about it and I'm, get, I'm getting the gripes out of the way first by the way because it's a really good movie yeah um, is the relationship between the main character and the wife who the widow yeah I think that was unnecessary I think it detracted from the emotion of the film I think there were a lot of awkward moments like when he went to say goodbye to her and she was having a fucking shower it's like yeah that was oh, that was just an excuse for so i i think i was thinking about that in the beginning of the movie and i couldn't remember how they handled that and having watched it again and we'll get into the exact details of this i think they handled it well um no i i do because they they resisted the hollywood urge of them having some kind of uh, romantic tryst in the middle of the movie like it happens slowly. She starts off absolutely despising him, as you would. But when yeah. she sees him, like, taking care of her children and, like, actually trying to help out, like, around the house and trying to, like, learn about them and everything, she grows to respect him. But at that point, I wouldn't even say it's, like, affectionate. It's he old... does, like, two things for her, though. <laughs> That's but it, all we see. But he's there for months. Yeah, okay. It, it's a montage. You're not going to... It's like... You're going to show all six months of him doing petty chores and playing with the kids. like they're, they're... Well, exactly, but they are all, like, petty things. There was never any absolute meaningful things that he did for her, I don't think. But but I think that that's kind of the point, is that she's not, like, he's not... They're not doing the Hollywood thing of him riding in on a, on a white steed and saving her from goblins or some shit like that. He's doing what, like, an actual, like, rural farmer-type, like, per- family would would respect and value the most he's taking care of the children he's making sure that like the you know the house is 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 cared for he's like you know he's he's helping in thing in ways that are meaningful in like a rural setting like you're right in a city none of that shit would really be that important but in a rural farmer kind of setting especially like a feudal medieval kind of setting that stuff is like you can't undervalue that stuff so I, I yeah, think he's it's only doing that because like, he killed her fucking husband. I know, and that's why I think that the way they did it makes sense. Like it, 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 maybe it didn't need to be there at all. But she starts off hating him, and then slowly grows to respect him. And they never even say whether or not um, 
you know, that respect uh, grows into anything romantic. Like, they resist the Hollywood urge of ever having, like, you know, just an out-and-out -out scene of some kind that directly says that, hey, they're together. They were fucking making out while she put his armor, his, her old husband's armor on him. That is, my, in my eyes, was was black and white. Okay. I thought um, it was a lot more subtle than that, but. And then she went home. He went home to her as well at the end. He did. I don't know. I thought at least maybe I'm comparing it to other like Hollywood things, but like they resisted the urge to be overt. And I think it was handled pretty well in that regard. Yeah, I mean, they didn't bang, but, like... God. I don't know. Even, even at the beginning, when he was getting the snot kicked out of him by the general of the... Um, by the, the military general of the samurai. Hmm. She was like, oh, like, so worried. Oh, my goodness, he's getting his ass kicked. No, that's, and then, like, three no, scenes later... That's in my notes. And I, I that's something I want to talk about when we get to it. Because I... Three... Sorry. Go on. I was trying to finish the sentence originally, and then you saw my notes. Um, three scenes later, she was like, yeah, I want him to fucking die. Get him out of my house. And it's like, well, that was a bit of a fucking sharp turn. No, it wasn't. I think you're vastly misinterpreting what she was seeing there. Um, like, so I'll, we'll, we'll talk about when we get to that scene. Um... Because I too want to go over the plot, so we're not just talking about random things without any context. Go for it. Um, one other thing I want to kind of disillusion. This was a criticism of the movie back when it, it came out at the time. People seem to have the impression that um, Tom Cruise was supposed to be the last samurai, as if he just like became a samurai in the movie, and then everyone else died. And now he's the only samurai left. It's mm -hmm. like no, the, samurai is plural. It's the last samurai, as in the last of the samurai. All of those samurai that are fighting in that battle, they were the last samurai. He was just a witness to them. And I, it's something that I hear repeated so often, it just annoys me. So I just, I, or I heard it repeated often at the time. Um, anyway, so movie opens up. You've got uh, Tom Cruise's character. I can't remember his first name. His last name is Algren, I think. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, he's, um, like, a, a veteran of, like, the, the kind of wars that were waged by the U.S. against, like, the Native American populations across the West. Um, kind of traumatized by what he's seen. He's uh, pretty much just constantly drunk. And he's doing these little shows for the Winchester Rifle Corporation to just, excuse me, make ends meet. Uh, he gets approached by someone in San Francisco, and he, uh, like, finds out that the Japanese, uh, they're hiring, like, they're opened up now to the rest of the world, and they're hiring, you know, Western experts from Europe and the U.S. to train their army, get their infrastructure going, um, build new buildings, help them with, like, you know, modern governments and things like that. And... Uh, they are hiring him to well to help train their army. They offer him a really good price, but he's going to have to work for the guy who commanded his unit to apparently kill off some civilians while he was, you know, in the actual army. And um, so anyway, he agrees. He goes off, and he's clearly like torn about the whole thing because he's like, "Am I just being hired to like take down another like tribal warlord, just like what happened with the Native Americans?" And um, you know, he gets there, meets up with people. He's studying things. They meet the emperor. They meet the guy who hired them, and um, sorry, I'm actually struggling with the with the plot there. I've so been, after that, he starts training the troops. Yeah. And the I, I really liked the troop training scenes. Especially when he's, like, coaching the, um... Hmm. When he's... Oh, no, that was the, the, the Scottish guy. Um, he's, like, um... Yeah, they obviously don't speak Japanese. They have translators there to help translate the orders and everything. But the Scottish guy gets the troops in line by just, like shouting at them essentially he's there's this scottish guy who's like his sergeant to help train 
And he's like, if you guys don't get in line, I'll shit kick every Far Eastern buttocks like I see or something like that. And and then they, they all like straighten up and line up. And then he just like makes a comment to him. He's like, it's every if once you understand the language, everything just falls in line. Yeah. Um, and anyway. he was a really good character. I'm, I'm sad he wasn't in the film more. Yeah, he, spoiler alert, he, he does die off pretty early. Yeah, they dropped him pretty hard. Well, they, uh, um, so to get to that, they've they've done like a little bit of training for the troops, and they find out that the uh, the person they're supposed to be going after, he um, he's attacked like a railway station, and so they want them to move out early and take him out. And the, his his old commanding officer, he's like really confident that they'll have no problem taking care of him, and. Um, the uh, the Japanese guy that hired him, he's also like, oh, you have to protect my railroads. It's the most important thing. It's kind of like clearly a self interest thing. And Tom Cruise is like, no, no, they, they're they're not ready. And he does like a little demo and scares the shit out of one of his soldiers to prove that they're not ready. And um, but they they insist, and so they go out. Um, they end up fighting them in the forest, and the troops panic. They fire too early. The Scottish mm. guy gets a spear through his chest, um, and Tom Cruise gets captured after fighting off some random people in the mud and through basically sheer luck, you know, stabbing one of the samurai in the throat with like a broken spear. Yeah, up to this point, the film is very reminiscent of the Sharp films. Uh, I don't, I don't think you would have. Um, had a, it's a British uh, book series, very old. They made a couple of them into films. Uh, Sharp spelled S H R A R P E, mm -hmm. who is a uh, soldier who kind of retired but get, keeps getting called back mm. uh, in. Uh, it's not Australia. Some of the it was a it was a I think it was a Middle Eastern country somewhere. Okay. And he's it's all like the red coats and things, and he has to train up the the troops. And he's got a Scottish uh, assistant Just who is like his sergeant. Yeah. Yep. And it, it, there's a lot of very similar um, happenstances. Um, but they're great as well, so I mean, I'd suggest that as well. <laughs> I might have to take it out. I wonder if that the rifle's name, because there's a Sharp rifle, or a Sharp's rifle, and I'm just wondering if it's named after him. Uh, I don't know. He's a fictional character, so... Oh, maybe not then. Maybe, well, maybe that's where they got his name. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so Tom Cruise, get, is, he's injured, but he's captured, um, and he gets taken back to the, the village. This is where he meets, like, the, um, the person who's leading the samurai faction, uh, Ka Kazumoto, I think? I'm terrible with names. I'm pretty sure that was, it, it starts with a K, and it sounds kind of like that, at least. <laughs> um, and the guy informs them that, you know, he's a prisoner. They're in his son's village, and the winter's coming. They're deep in the mountains. He's not going to be able to, to leave. So he can't run. And so he gets kind of nursed back to health um, by this this woman, and he sees, like, a few people, like, you know, off and on. And eventually he's, he's well enough to, to leave. He also takes this opportunity to be forcibly sobered up. Like, he's going through. He's clearly got PTSD, like, some flashbacks of everything. There's a scene where he's, like, shouting for sake. Um, PTSD from his wars in America, not the wars here. Yeah, the war in America, yeah, where he had was forced to, like, kill civilians and everything like that. And so, mm. um, he eventually is healed enough to walk around, and he starts to wander the village. And uh, we are introduced to a minor character, who is still one of my favorites, uh, Bob. The, uh, the, the older samurai that follows him around. Right, yeah. He won't, he won't say a word to him, and he... So he's like... He's like, uh... So you got a name? Alright, I'll just call you Bob. I knew a Bob one time. God, he was ugly. <laughs> and, like the, and so he, he wanders the village, and there's kind of like a voiceover of him as he's learning about them, talking about how they essentially are just a very dedicated people like they from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed they are essentially devoting themselves to trying to perfect whatever task it is that they're doing and it montage of people you know firing arrows doing farming work wrestling 
um, practicing swords, uh, you know, crafting stuff. Um, anyway, he does eventually come across the samurai uh, leader, uh, and the two of them have a conversation. They introduce, they're introduced to each other, and it's clear that the samurai leader is not gonna like mistreat him in any way, but he's, you know, he's he wants to know his enemy essentially. Hmm. Um, and yeah, that it, the story continues on like that for a little bit. Um, then the ninja attack. That nope, that doesn't happen yet. First, okay. we got to address the scene you're talking about. The samurai general, like he's he sees two kids playing with wooden swords out in the rain. And so one of the kids, like, knocks the sword out of the other kid's hand. He picks it up and goes to hand it back to the kid. And the kid kind of bows and moves away. And the son of the head of the samurai, he tells him, go ahead, you know, you know, try fighting the kid. You know, they're, they're young, but they're pretty strong or pretty good. And the kid almost kicks his ass because he's better with the sword than him. Um, well, he does it one-handed. He beats the kid. Yeah, he does beat the kid, but the kid surprises him. He almost hits him, like, like right. the kid's fast at first. Yeah. Um... Anyway, the samurai general um, comes over and picks the sword up from the kid and then goes yeah. to, like, him and that guy square off and they have this, this fight in the rain and the guy, you know, knocks him down. Tom Cruise gets back up and goes to fight him again. Then the guy whacks the sword out of his hand and knocks him down. Then he grabs the sword again, stands up, and it only ends when the guy slaps him in the face with a sword and, like, basically KOs him and then throws yeah. the sword away. Now, I believe those wooden swords are called Bokken, by the way. Uh, yeah, or Bokudo. Yeah. But the... Um, the this is the pit. I, I really think you're misinterpreting her look. Because the, the woman who is taking care of him, you find out in... I don't know if we know it yet, but you find out pretty soon that she was the wife of the samurai that he killed by sheer luck before he was captured. Um... A combination of luck and skill, and so she. But she's she's also the, she's the one caring for him now, um, and she has that responsibility because she's the sister of the the head of this samurai faction, uh, uh, Kazumoto. And so she has a very somber and somewhat sad look while she's walk, watching him get his ass kicked in the rain by the other samurai. And you're interpreting that as her like feeling bad for him. But I saw it this way. I saw it as, like, her, like, thinking, God, is this loser the one that killed my husband? Mm, maybe. Like, that was the impression I got. And I did think that that scene kind of embodied a theme. Because the, a theme throughout this entire movie is, like, a clash of cultures. Uh, like, the, the modern Western culture clashing with the old honor-based like feudal Japanese culture and them just not really meshing that well right off the bat and they're trying to force them to like they, they're the emperor and like his his advisor are trying to force them to modernize very quickly and kind of throw out their old ways and it's not the working out so well yeah fish by the way who the emperor oh yeah the emperor was kind of a pussy in that movie he he grows yeah. some balls by the end but yeah sort of i mean it just took you know a few thousand people dying before but yeah when he spoke up to his advisor i guess yeah a little bit then but everywhere else throughout the whole movie yeah. i was just like no yeah, it was a bit of a pansy for the rest of the movie but the other thing i thought that like that fight scene kind of embodied it because the general guy is like kind of confused every time Tom Cruise gets back up in that fight. And I think it's it's that way cuz like you're if you're defeated in that culture you're supposed to accept it and you know you're kill yourself. Yeah, exactly. If it's in battle or if it's in practice you're supposed to just concede and but Tom Cruise kept getting back up and kept fighting and that that kind of like persistence is more embodies the at least the American culture at the time of just I mean it you makes kind of makes sense because I mean, if you're in a battle with and everyone's using samurai swords, the chance of you just getting like a uh, surviving after being hit is probably a lot lower than many other weapons. Like it's it's not, not surprising that if someone fucking hit you with a sword, that you'd be getting it down and out. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you're 
shot unless it hits you somewhere vital. There's a good chance yeah, you can take survive. The, take it, yeah. Anyway, so then, uh, so after a while, uh, Tom Cruise, like, essentially accepts his time there. He has, you know, more and more conversations and begins to respect the samurai leader. The samurai leader starts to respect him, and um, he starts to spend more time, like, you know, getting to know the family he's with, tries to start to learn some Japanese, and starts starts to spend time with the, you know, the, the woman's kids, and right after that fight scene, she talks to the samurai leader and just wants him dead. Like, she she wants him to execute um, Tom Cruise. Like, this this is not... Like, this is horrible. I can't live in the same house with the man that killed my husband. This is, like, it's beyond shameful. And he's like, no, no, we, we need him. You gotta do this. Just deal with it. Um, but over time, like, she at least grows to resent him less. And, um, finally, near the end of his time in the village, what you were talking about, there was a ninja attack. And not, like, anything silly, like actual ninja, which were basically the assassins of the, uh, feudal Japanese era. I mean, it was a bit silly. <laughs> I mean, are you talking about the part where they shot an actor in the face? Do you, uh... do you not remember that? No. One of the guys, uh, one of the kabuki actors on stage, he was wearing a mask and he gets shot oh, right in the head with yeah. an arrow. No, just the fact that they're like, I don't know, maybe it was fully accurate, but it seemed like, you know, these faceless, dark robed men monkey crawling around the village and then like jumping through screens one at a time to fight people and then getting their ass handed to them repeatedly. So... Up until the po yeah, them jump coming in one at a time, that was a little silly, but and probably made to make the the scene a little bit more tense. But them crawling around the how they actually infiltrated that's pretty historically accurate. Okay. Um, it's just when they get to the point where they're actually in the house and Tom Cruise is wrestling with a ninja and one ninja almost loses to a child and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, like he gets like bitch slapped by the the woman. Yeah, no, she, she legit, she stabbed him in the, like, in the groin. That was brutal. <laughs> and, um, when the ninja has Tom Cruise on the floor, and he's, like, trying to force his face onto, the, like, the samurai blade, mm. right? Right at the beginning, the very first ninja kill just straight up snapped a dude's neck. <laughs> like, why was he trying to fucking force it onto the blade? Again, yeah, th that's where they indulge a little bit in the Hollywood yeah, and also, apparently Tom Cruise's neck muscles are stronger than both of this guy's arms. <laughs> Tom Cruise. Um, anyway, so they manage to fight off the ninja, and at the end, it comes to a scene where Tom Cruise and uh, the, the head samurai, uh, Kazumoto, they, they've both fought off each other, and cause they have this, like, eye-to-eye -eye moment, where they're just, like, they've both got their their weapons out and they've they've killed everyone and i i really i, I got a lot out of that that one moment because it's kind of the first moment where like it kind of so, together yeah. yeah it solidifies that respect that had been growing between them and you see because the the implication there like tom cruise is now armed like he could have run he could have escaped he could have just done nothing he could have killed the family let the family get killed but no he defended them and that that like i think that feeds into that hmm. anyway so the time in the samurai village ends and they're called to or they've given they're given safe passage to go into tokyo to have an audience with the emperor uh they get there tom cruise is released he gets his old clothes his old uh pistol back and he's you know told he's free to go and checks in with the army and the generals and now they're much better armed they've got howitzer cannons they've got um gatling guns uh they're regimented and uh his old co the jackass comes by and goes like dear god you're alive man or something like that i don't remember what he says exactly. yeah he's a bit of a dickhead yeah he's a dickhead for most of the movie anyway so they also have a scene where Cosmodo meets with the Emperor, and the Emperor, uh, he essentially tells the Emperor that 
you know, I'm doing this rebellion for you. I'm trying to, you know, cleave all away. The Umbra. Sorry. <laughs> cleave <laughs> away all of these like people giving you shit advice and trying to help you see what's best for your people. And then the emperor basically bitches out and asks him to make a decision for him. Mm. And Kazumoto's like, I can't do that. You are a living god. Like, you know, you must find the wisdom for all of us or something like that. And the emperor just looks sad. <laughs> <laughs> Emperor sends crying emoji face. <laughs> anyway, so after a while, Kazumoto uh, gets basically placed under house arrest, and the main guy who hired them all to come here in the first place uh, tries to have him assassinated. Um, and Tom Cruise hears about this and gathers together a small like force of the samurai that he met in the village. And... Um, <clears throat> the the british guy and they they go in and another funny scene when they're trying to fast talk their way past the guard at the beginning uh mm. of this scene and the british guy is like talking in japanese really fast and the guard is like telling him no you can't come in here we, we orders no one to come in and tom cruise is just pushing the british guy forward and he's like just keep talking just keep walking don't stop and he just the british guy with increasing anger is just like talking more and more and he eventually says do you know who this is this is the president of the united states here to lead our armies in victory in battle <laughs> and the guy eventually lets them through and um as they're walking through because tom cruise knows some japanese now he's like the president of the united states really and he's like i, I think i made a mistake <laughs> anyway they they break cosmoto out but his son does end up dying um because he gets, you know, shot with rifle fire. He has a really epic end, by the way, I think. Like, just on a bridge, shooting yeah. people with arrows. And Stormtroopers then he... firing randomly into the air, it seems, while they die. Yep. Uh, yeah. And then, but, well, I mean, all the bullets go into him once he's out of arrows. Yeah. <laughs> he runs out of arrows, and then they shoot his dead body about 15 times. Yeah, that was a bit much. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? everyone misses, misses, misses for, like, 20 seconds, and then suddenly 15 guns hit him at the same time, and then they fire again, and again. Which, how are they doing that? Those were muskets, they were single shot. Mm. Oh, oh, my God. Anyway, so, that happens, they, um, they escape, they make it back to Cosmodo's village, and they realize that people are going to be coming after them. And Cosmodo is kind of in depression. He's like, you know, I'm I'm from a different age, and uh, he Tom Cruise is like, so you're gonna take your own life? And Cosmodo says, you know, what other way is there? And Tom Cruise is like, well, we'll hold on. We can we can do this together. We can make the Emperor hear you. The American way. <laughs> <laughs> Battle. Anyway, so yeah, they go back to the village, organize uh, some sort of a resistance, and they try to think like they've got several thousand people coming after them and they've only got like 500 samurai and they have rifles and cannons and stuff and they have horses and bows and swords mm -hmm. this battle scene is just epic in general so they find a way to funnel them in and take them out and um they manage to like rout one entire thousand person regiment not lose all their troops they still have like maybe 50 or to 100 but they've lost a decent amount of troops it was a little bit dumb why they just started in the line of the cannons and then they ran away. Yeah, I, I didn't really get the the reasoning behind that. Like, was it to... I think it was to bait them in. Like, they, they had to look like they were, you know, running. That, that was, I think, the thinking behind it. But yeah, I, I think they committed too many troops to that. Anyway, yeah. but not, not to cr critique the strategy of the whole thing. Uh, eventually it all culminates in a cavalry charge with what's left of the samurai and there are, you know there's cannon fire going down there are people getting shot left and right and so th but eventually they're down to like maybe 10 or 20 people on horseback they manage mm -hmm. to break through the line and they're almost up to the hill where the the generals and soldiers are which is this is the one point where i think um sergeant dickhead the dude who is tom cruise's commanding officer had one moment of redemption like, he didn't just stay in the back line. When he saw them charging, he was like, you know, mm. this, I'm actually going to go there with my troops. And he did, 
but he still got shanked in the chest. He did. So he has a little bit of redemption well, before he dies. Well, Shanks' dies. spear went through him. Yeah, yeah. Tom, Tom Cruise javelin throws a katana through his chest. Mm. Um, anyway, and this is, I think, one of the most emotional and poignant scenes in the whole movie for me. Because at this point, there's been this kind of building, triumphant music, like, oh, they're charging, they're, they're going to make it, they're going to make it. And then they, they bring out the machine guns, the, uh, yeah, the Gatling, Gatling guns. guns, and the music just cuts, and all you just hear is the rattle of the machine gun fire as they're just mowed down. And um, then when the music does come back, it's slow and it's, like, very sad. Yeah, somber. Yeah. And there's this really powerful moment at the very end where... Um, they, they all get killed by the Gatling gun. Yeah, they're all, they're all dead. Tom Cruise is heavily injured, but not mortally injured. Kazumoto is mortally injured, and he grabs a sword and he asks Tom Cruise to help him, you know, kill himself so he can die with honor. Yeah, I thought he was going to do the thing where... He stabs himself, then Tom Cruise cuts his head off. Yeah, I, but I, I guess that wouldn't have been Hollywood enough. <laughs> yeah, that, not really. And I think he was already so injured he was dying anyway. It was more of just like an honor thing. Like, I'm just, I'm going to be the one that, that kills myself. I'm not going to die to bullet wounds or whatever. Or bleed mm. out. And so, very emotional scene. That finishes. And then this culminates in the scene Blue was talking about where all the soldiers see this. And, like, they're so moved by it. Uh, they've already stopped firing because... Like, they were, like, the, the sergeant watching this was just so heartbroken watching these, you know, samurai being mowed down by the machine gun that he stops it. And then when they see that that scene at the end where Cosmodo um, commits seppuku, he, like, they all just gather around them and all bow, like, just on the ground, head to the, head to the floor, just to, out of respect for the guy. And then there's, there's a scene at the end of the movie where Tom Cruise delivers Cosmodo's sword to the Emperor and tells him about, you know, his, his you know, th what, what his message to him was. And um, the Emperor is, is moved by it and finally understands. And he's like, you know, we're, we're going too quickly. We can't, we can't lose who we are as Japanese. And his advisor guy, the tubby jackass, has been, is like, He's like, no, no, you can't do this. You know, don't listen to this. Man fought against you. And then he, the Emperor rounds on that guy, and he's like, you know, fuck you. I'm going to take some of your assets, and if you don't like it, kill yourself. Which, again, yeah, the, literally. The one moment where the Emperor. Yeah, no, that's not just me being hyperbolic. He literally tells him to kill himself. Which is the one moment where the Emperor actually has some balls in the whole yeah, movie. If, you, if your shame is too great, I will let you end it for yourself. Yeah. And he hands yeah, him the sword, like, yeah, and then the guy, like, very panically bows and backs away. Yeah. And that's, that's... Like, you were doing it with him tripping down the step a little bit. But, yeah, that was yeah. that was kind of funny. Anyway, um, and then the movie ends with Tom Cruise going back to that village to live out the rest of his days in the place where he... Mm. The one place he had found peace, because, you know, while he was living there, his trauma from the other wars he'd been in just faded away. Which I think there's yep. something to that, like the calm, rural country lifestyle, where it's just like, you know, simple life. Yeah. Anyway, there's... that's the plot. I know you have stuff to talk about, so I won't keep it too Well, long. we're already at 35 minutes, so I think we, uh, maybe we just do that for the third segment today, I don't know. Alright. Well, not, I don't know. We can talk in oh. the interim, but any... But yeah, really good else? movie. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I'm not a massive fan of Tom Cruise either, to be honest. Um, just in general as a person, maybe that's why I dislike the romance part of it so much. Um, but the, the, the general, I really liked him. Uh, the villain was pretty good. Uh, I love the, the British photographer, weirdly. Uh, I thought he was very funny. <laughs> yeah. And also, it, the, his his ending was that, you know, he went off, took photos of the village, told the story, and gave it, a, like, a, a history to it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I don't know if... I mean, he went back to the village, but now the village, he's the only man in the village, so I don't know what happened. Well, 
Not the only Who's one. Who's that? He's the only, like, samurai that survived and went back. Um, well, not samurai, but the only fighter that survived. But there would have been, like, artisans and people, like the blacksmith right. and stuff. So, but yeah, the male population in the village severely depleted after that. Also, there was, like, the, 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 the little kids, they were trained to be samurai, so technically the last samurai was still... Alive, yeah, it was, you little, know. It was those two kids, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, really good film. Recommend it. If you've got, you know, three hours to spare or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, two and a half. And to be fair, like, even during the movie, like, you, like, it, it cut um, to the, the scene just before he talked to the Emperor, and you're like, this is probably a good place to take a break. You thought we were halfway through the movie. We had, like, ten minutes left at that point. Yeah, I... Before we started, I set, like, a time in my head where I thought it was halfway through, and I was just straight up wrong. Um... But, it, I mean, it shows how, how much it really does just fly by. Hmm. Well, like, it got to that scene, and I was like, man, I'm really curious as to what happens after this battle, then, because there's still a lot more to go, and then there just wasn't an answer to the battle, really. I'm like, oh, that was a bit disappointing. Uh, <laughs> I set my expectations unnecessarily high. Yeah. Uh, God. Yeah, it was a great movie, though. Um, mm. Still one of my absolute favorites. I haven't seen it in a few years, but when I like when I was a kid, oh my god, I I watched yeah, definitely that movie still, so much. Definitely still stands up to this day. Yeah, and like you said, there's there's some Hollywood moments that are a bit iffy, but they it's it's more subdued than a lot of like a lot of times when Hollywood gets their hands on something, they'll I don't know just fall back on very tired tropes but this one they they resisted that in a lot of ways they they don't mm. all the way but so. oh all right you wanted to talk about castlevania but we are coming up on the end here um we'll we'll, we'll talk about in the interim what we're going to be doing for segment three because it was going to be long story short this week but i have an idea for a kind of a hybrid wild card segment um we'll, mm -hmm. we'll we'll talk about it in the interim you people listening, you'll hear us in a few seconds, so uh, you'll find out what you we decide. You people. You people. Give me a mannequin. Fucking Palpatine says. Oh, man. All right. This is going to be the end of segment two of the TMCJ podcast. Thank you all for listening, and you will hear us again momentarily for segment three. Welcome back to the TMCJ Podcast. We are on segment three, our wild card segment, and it really is wild card this week because um, we had too much media to talk about in the media segment. Blue has been watching more of that Castlevania Netflix series, right? Um, and I wanted to talk about that. It won't take us the whole way through segment three, so for the ending to it, uh, since most of our other like game segments that we do uh, uh, will take up the entire segment or more, uh, what we decided to do is that kind of test case I did a while back where Blue would just name a random topic and I would try to pull a story from my life at some point to, to talk about. Um, that should round out the rest of the time nicely. So, without further ado, mm -hmm. Blue. Okay, well, I ironically haven't watched much Castlevania, but there has been so much content packed into these last few episodes that I needed to like slow it right down. Um, and I started watching this on uh, where it was it would have been this time last week mm. so I may have missed a few details but so we left off they were in like this um, museum underneath the uh, estate of the I can't remember it begins with a B doesn't matter uh, I, I remember this because you were talking about how the vampire dude was uh, he saw a pile of skulls and he's like this is like a museum dedicated to how to kill me yeah, so Alucard, the, the son of Dracula. Um, so Alucard, Sage Girl, and Hunter Guy, uh, they were all down there, and suddenly it gets attacked by demons and the vampire. Well, the vampires send demons to, to, to kill them and basically burn the library to the ground. So the demons arrive, the hunter goes up to defend, whilst Alucard is trying to fix a magic mirror and Sage is trying to figure out a spell to draw the castle to them. Um, the hunter kicks the ass of all these crazy looking demons that come through the doorway 
in a variety of ways, mostly by exploding their head, though, with a magical mace that he has. Not mace, um, like a ball and chain kind of thing. Uh, morning Star. Whatever it's called. It's the Morning Star, yeah. Um, yeah, so they do that, and the mirror starts working, and the chick who, before you, you kind of just think she's just a regular frickin' mage. But, like, looking through the magic mirror so she can see Dracula's castle, she just is able to completely move Dracula's entire castle to where they are. Oh. And this castle is not small. This is a huge fucking castle. Um... Anyway, but I've actually got a bit ahead of myself because the castle was m moved to a uh, the port town of I can't remember where, <laughs> which is like the, the the only place where the humans could get off the continent if they were trying to escape. So the vampires wanted to cut it off and then work their way back to the country. Yeah. Um, Carmilla, who is the uh, the evil evil vampire who's in Dracula's council. Uh, whispers in the ear of most of the vampires and also one of the forge master humans and so she has her own small army of forged creatures of the night mm. um, and she's, you know, she says she's doing it in the long run for the good of the vampires and Dracula and all that shit uh, one of the other vampires the viking one goes to the uh, the whipped human forge master and he's like so we need to do this and this and you know it'll be for the good of Dracula in the long run and the whipped dude is like so uh, what happens if Dracula doesn't agree with this plan and he's like oh well you know we'll make sure that he agrees to this plan and he's kind of laughing and walking away, and the fucking whip dude. Mm. So, so okay, his whip. It's it's not like a whip. It's like a leather paddle with studs in it, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the studs are kind of sharp. So the vampire's like laughing and walking away, and the dude's like, "All right." Stands up, walks up behind him, throws it around his neck, rips his neck open. And then just starts, like, beating the ever-loving crap out of this vampire inside of Dracula's castle, just in his room. And then he, he, like, burns him to ashes and releases the ashes somewhere else. He doesn't tell anyone, not even Dracula. He, although he does have a conversation with Dracula where Dracula thinks there are people betraying him and he kind of comes and confirms that he's, like... He's obviously the only one who's fully loyal to Dracula. Mm -hmm. um, Which is and there's why definitely that a guy. Yeah, there's there's some serious fucking respect going on. Um, so he's having a conversation with Dracula, and he's like, "If someone were to betray you, my lord, it would be my duty to deal with them, and you wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would have it so that you wouldn't even know." So that's his the ways, their way of emphasizing that. It doesn't matter. The guy's out of the picture now. He was a traitor. It's been sorted, sir. Yeah. Um, really fucking cool scene. I The character's grown on me very much. Um, so, yeah. And then... So, so they land at this portside town. And all of the vampire generals, minus Carmilla and the Forge Masters, so mm. just, just the regular fucking vampires, walk out over a bridge... Um, with their hordes of Dracula's army. Meanwhile, Carmilla's private army is already in there, in the city, and she has a um, a reanimated priest of the church walk into the river that they're crossing over the bridge, bless the water, which incinerates the priest, because he's been reanimated, so yeah, he has yeah. part so he's, of hell he's in him. unholy, yeah. Yeah. And then they rip the bridge out from underneath the vampires. So they all and, like, fall the, into the holy water. The whole army, and I think one or two of the generals, just get instantly incinerated. 
the rest of them fall back to, into the castle. Then Carmilla's vampires fire bri like remote bridges across the canal, charge straight into Dracula's castle, and there's a fight between all these lesser vampires, and then obviously the vampire generals are also on the side of Dracula. So is this is this like a civil war kind of thing? This is a civil war. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So she's not even. She, so this, this, she obviously yeah. whispered in the ear of the vampires, but she was not ha saving them. Right. Yeah. No. That's the thing I was trying to make sure of is that so there's three factions going on right now. There's the the tribe, like the little group of adventurers that has Alucard yep. in it. There's Dracula's faction um, and his council of evil that goes in his castle, mm. and then there's now Carmilla and her faction who are trying to usurp Dracula. Yeah, so I kind of consider it the, the little group of three people are the good guys, Dracula is the neutral, and Carmilla is the evil. I mean, it's a show, so, about, in a show about vampires, we want to genocide all humans is the neutral option. <laughs> yeah, but I mean... No, I'm, I agree with you. I agree with your assessment. I just yeah. find it funny. He, he, he's more really angry at the church, but he kind of... Because he's, he's a different species to them, maybe he just thinks... We've taken They're all the time. same. Yeah, yeah. They the, the civilians didn't stop her being burnt when the church grabbed her. Yeah, they're as equally to blame. Um. Okay, so there's this big battle happening in the castle. That is when the sage's spell kicks in, and the the castle is kind of fighting back against it. So the castle kind of teleports within about a mile radius, like teleports around three or four times, mm. just obliterating the city. Because it's just like merging with the city, then being ripped up again, then merging, and then pfft, uh, holy water goes fucking everywhere. God, that feeling when your fucking Wi-Fi won't connect properly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just like buffering. <laughs> um, a bunch of the holy water goes into Dracula's castle and wipes out like most of the army. In fact, yeah, pretty much all of both armies. Dear God. Carmilla uh, turns on her forge master basically makes him into a slave and drags him across the bridge away. Uh, so, and then the castle appears at the Belmont Estate. That's the name. So, there's like a handful of generals left, a couple of, like, foot soldiers from both sides who got to higher ground. And the three adventurers come up out of the library, walk straight into the castle. Both Carmilla's forces the generals and Dracula's forces all attack the three of them. And the three of them just wipe the floor with all of them. <laughs> like, even the vampire generals, they get fucking moided. Uh, in some very creative ways. Um, there's a really cool... One of the vampires is like this um, kabuki Japanese goddess kind of thing. Mm. And she, like, can turn into mist and stuff. And so she's, like, they cut her head off and she just turns into mist and just reforms. And then as she's turning into this giant mist creature, the sage just freezes her <laughs> and then crunches her into the ground. It's very cool. Um, yeah, all the vampires get killed. And so suddenly it's just the three of them in the castle and Dracula is upstairs. Oh, and... The loyal uh, forge master, mm. the guy who like like murked the other guy who was thinking of betraying Dracula. Yeah, exactly. So the forge master sees them coming and he runs up the stairs and he goes into Dracula's room and he's like, "Sir, I'm gonna stand here and die for you." Uh, and so he's talking to Dracula with his back to Dracula, and Dracula's slowly. Uh, with like telekinesis, not telekinesis. Um, also, where you can control things from afar. That is telekinesis. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he's slowly building a shattered mirror behind him, mm -hmm. uh, silently, and he's talking to the guy all the time. And he's like, "You've been a really good, loyal friend to me. Um, I only have one regret, and that is that I can't let you do what you're doing now." Picks him up, throws him through the mirror. Just into a whole different part of the world and closes it behind him. So that was really fucking good. I loved that. That was the loyalty paid off. Mm. And he was mad as fuck because he was like, no, I wanted to die for you, master. Yeah. And now he's stuck in the middle of a desert. 
Um, yes, yeah, so they arrive in Dracula's room, and Alucard's there, like, this time I'm gonna kill you, because this time I've got friends. Because um, he tried to kill Dracula right at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and he got his this, I mean, this is, it's funny, because this, like, this is the plot of the Castlevania video game. You're Alucard fighting your way through Dracula's castle to finally kill Dracula. And so there's this big battle, and like two thirds of it is Ak is Alucard and Dracula fighting. Like the first third of it is the Sage and Hunter helping out, but really it's pretty much just Alucard. Yeah. And so they're smashing through all these different parts of the castle, um, and then finally it's a I get I was getting a lot of similarities to the the show you were talking about with the dad and son fighting each other. Oh, Invincible, yeah. Yep, and he's like throwing him through walls and shit. And he throws him through this wall. He's about to he's standing over Alakai, he's about to fucking finish him off, and he's like, Oh, this is your this is your bedroom. And there's like a picture of Dracula and his wife on the wall mm. with this little blonde haired boy. Mm -hmm. And he's like looking at it and he's like, Oh my god. I'm killing my son. The only good thing that I ever made, kind of thing that that you gave to me, the greatest gift you gave to me, yeah. And I'm killing my son. I am already dead, he says. Mm. And then Alucard breaks one of the bedposts slowly, walks up to him and just stakes him through the heart of it. Dear it's God. fucking brutal. It's it gets to that point where you're like, when he's doing it, you can see it coming. And you're like, oh, I kind of wish it doesn't happen now because Dracula's an awesome fucking character. Mm. And he obviously feels this shame and regret, and his eyes break up. Um, so yeah, he stakes him through the heart. Dracula turns into like the skeleton. He's like reaching out for his son, and then the hunter comes into the room from behind, cuts Dracula's head off, and then the sage incinerates the ashes. It's like, oh shit, Dracula's dead. Fully, fully dead. And the series isn't over yet, though, right? That was episode seven of the second series. Bear in mind, there are four series at the moment. Dear God, where are they going to go from here? You already killed right? Dracula. That's I was like, holy shit. Okay. Um, so, that happens. Uh, and now they're left with this giant castle full of the most advanced sciences known to the world, mm. right on top of a vault, which has the most advanced human sciences in the world, <laughs> uh, and all these like books, this library, this very incredible weapons, and so Belmont turns to Alucard and he's like, "Okay, you you want to stay here because it's your it's your home essentially, mm. and my home." You look after them both for me. Rebuild the Belmont Estate. Make it a proper home. Um, and the Hunter and the Sage go off on their own. Go back, travelling. Um, the Carmilla and the Human Slave... The Human Slave gets... Not Slave. The Human Forge Master, sorry. Gets even more shit kicked out of him. by coming. She's just beating the crap out of him. Like, she knows that he's useful, but he's also a lesser being, and she doesn't <laughs> need him in great shape. shouting in the background. You can hear that, okay, so. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and yeah, so that happens, so she she's dragging him off. Um, they, they're kind of wrapping up the stories. The, um, the, the slave dude, mm. the, who was whipped, um, he is at an oasis, and these, like, five people come up to him, and the first people that he meets in this new world, as it were, are like, let's kill him, or enslave him, or eat him. <laughs> just, like, six or seven humans, and he's like, wow, this really is just what humans are like, aren't they? <laughs> uh, and so he, he kind of, he gives them every opportunity to walk away, he's like, I'm just having a drink here, please, just on my main business. And they keep advancing on him. So he just straight up murders them all. And then 
reincarnates them as his own army. And he's like, maybe it'll be good to have my own army. So he's carrying on that fight. Um, then the new season. I've only seen the first episode of the new season. Hmm. It's very quickly established that the Hunter and the Sage are now together. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the end of the last series, they were like... She she said, um, kind of, I want to go everywhere with you. Yeah. So it's kind of implied. But there was a lot more lovey-dovey stuff in the first episode of the new one. <laughs> uh, and they're kind of going from town to town, killing monsters, mm. evil stuff. Um... And, oh god, there's such a funny line, you would have fucking loved it. They get to this town, and they're, they're living very poor, because they don't really get paid for what they do, they're kind of just living off the, the road kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And, because they get to this village, and they've got this werewolf tied up behind their cart, so that people know that they're good people. Mm. But they just kill the enemies that are around them. And he walks over to a beer stand, and he's like, I'm going to have a little bit of money in a minute. Can I just please... I haven't had a beer in so long. And he's like, You killed one of those monsters. You get a beer for free. <laughs> the almost monster's like, I, I love you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he's drinking the beer, and the sage is behind him. And the hunter's like, the almost like, Wow, that is literally better than sex. <laughs> And she's behind him, and she is pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and he's drinking the beer, and she freezes it in the mug. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. And it just just crunches to the ground, and he's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, I will oh, That's very funny. <laughs> Their dynamic is really quite good. Um, meanwhile, Alucard, it's been a month. Mm between the first and the second seasons. And... Wait, no, it's the second and third season. Yeah, yeah second and third. Sorry. And Alucard has remade most of the Belmont estate by himself, which is ridiculously fast, but whatever. He is a vampire, I guess. Yeah. And he's all on his own. He's picking vegetables, stuff like that. He sits down at the table, and he's got, like, two dolls that he's made, like, children's dolls, that look like Belmont and the Sage. Hmm. And he looks at the Belmont and he's like, you know, he, the, the, the two of them don't like each other, but they've got a respect for each other. Yeah. And he's kind of like doing the voice in his head. He's like, you know, I love beer and I have a tiny penis and I like to fuck pigs. <laughs> <laughs> like this elegant vampire dude is doing this voice. <laughs> and then he has another one for the sage. But um, and he's like, man, the loneliness. It's only been a month or so, I think, but I'm already going crazy. <laughs> um, and the vampire lady Carmilla full on asserts her dominance now drags him oh go on. oh she's okay no go on drags the, the human forge master back to her home castle hmm. where she's got these other three vampire sisters uh, she strips him naked has him locked up in a cell with a collar on throws, like, icy water over him to keep the smell away, and gives him, like, mouldy bread to eat. Mm. Um, so he's truly fucked. Um, and in a really bad place. Um, and they're planning on, you know, expanding and taking over the world. The, the usual evil bastard stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of where it's at. It's kind of established the sides. There's four stories. Yeah, there's a new... Uh, a new dynamic that's been established. Yep. Uh, Alucard on his own, the two wanderers, the whipped forge master, uh, who I'm, I'm really excited to hear more about his story because it's pretty fucking cool. And then the sisters who are just generic evil bastards, which I'm less interested in that one. There's an... Uh, yeah. Sorry, there's an, there's an old um, cartoon... Uh, that was on like daytime or Saturday mornings in the in the U.S. when I was growing up. Like, this would have been when I was in elementary or middle school, I think. Um, and it was called Pinky and the Brain. Yeah, Pinky and the Brain. Brain. Yep, yep, brain, yep, yep, brain. yep. That that one. 
And I just I'm reminded when you're talking about uh, uh, Camilla's story about the the opening line. It's like, what do you want to do tonight, Brain? And the the and the guy. The same thing like, we do every night. Try to take over the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I was thinking of when you were saying that. Yeah. Oh um, man. Well, I mean, yeah, honestly, fun. listening to that, I kind of, I really want to watch it now. I may actually, that may be my next uh, thing to watch once I'm mm-hmm. through with, uh, what am I working on right now? Oh, Morningstar, that's what's taking most of my time. That or Casa de Papel. People. Oh yeah, that, that's another one, yeah. yeah there's a few I think you really like watch. that. Oh, alright, well, we've got like ten minutes left. Um, we do. Do you want to do the, uh, let's, let's do that. Sure, sure. See if okay. I can get a few out. Uh, right. Do you want to start easy or more niche? Uh, I don't know. Dealer's choice. Just pick something. Uh, okay. Your first item will be candles. Candles. Oh, okay. I got a good one. Um, okay. So, when I, we, we, it was a birthday party. It was junior year in college. So, it was somebody's birthday. Mm. I don't remember exactly whose. Um, I had really long hair and, and well... I, I varied. I kind of fluctuated year to year whether I had really short or really long hair. It was just basically, yep. you know, I got sick of one and then went to the other and got sick of that. Student life. Yep. So I, I decided it would be funny if I put a candle in my mouth like a cigarette and lit it. But my hair was really long and it lit my bangs on fire. <laughs> like, it, the whole condo smelled like burnt hair for like a oh, solid gosh. day after that it didn't it didn't Oof. burn too much but i had like i got it out quickly and i you know trimmed away the the burnt bits but yeah. it was a really fucking stupid idea and yeah a lot of your ideas are mate <laughs> <laughs> uh okay cool um a time when you are uh eating out like a restaurant not a person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, w- I wouldn't want to tell the latter story on the podcast. <laughs> um, okay. This this isn't this is just kind of like a cool thing. Um, it's not mm. necessarily anything like special or particular happening about this, but there's a suburb of Boston called uh, Alston. And they had, like, a lot of really, really, really good restaurants there. And so we used to like to go there, like, in the, like, early early fall, late spring when it was, like, really warm out. Because they'd open these big sliding glass windows and essentially it'd be open air, like, in the restaurant. Yeah. And there was this Korean barbecue place we went to. And me and uh, my friend Will, we got this, um, we ordered sochu. Uh, but it was like unfiltered sochu, which is like a, it's a strong, like, rice wine based in Korea. Right. And um, they, it was like this milky white color, but they served it in like a dented tea kettle. And, and you drank it out of these little, like, metal bowls. Mm. Like, and they were they were pretty decent sized. I don't know. I just, it's it's a memory that kind of stuck with me. I just really liked that like place. Like the sake cup thing. No, no, but they were big. Oh. Like, they were, like, probably the size. Of a tangerine, ironically. <laughs> no, they were they were about like two inches across, um, and you know, an inch or so deep, and you just pour out of the tea kettle and just I don't know, it's just a really cool memory for me. Not anything particularly special about that story. It was just hmm. something I liked. Okay, uh, DIY. Oh, um, <laughs> there's there's a few things I could tell about that. Um, Hmm. I I just I just kind of have to pick one. This is really difficult. This isn't really <laughs> DIY, but it, it sort of is. So you know how they make those snow rakes? So like if you get a ton of well, maybe they don't in the UK, but it's so that your roof doesn't collapse. It's basically just a long pole with a rake in the end, so you can pull snow off of your roof. Um, right. Break ice dams and things like that. We could have bought one of those. Um, we had a really bad snowstorm one year yeah. at my parents' place, and like deep, it was something like at least two feet of snow. So it was risking like collapsing our garage roof because <laughs> there were ice dams at the at the back of it. And 
Rather than do that, what we did was I went up to the second floor of our house, climbed out one of the bedroom windows, and was just standing on our garage roof, shoveling the snow off with, with just a snow shovel. And the, the way my dad and I thought about it, it's like, well, you know what? If I fall off the roof, there's snow drifts down there. I'll just land in those. I'll be fine. <laughs> so, How high is your garage? Uh, it, it probably would have been like a 10, 12 foot fall, something like that. Okay. So it's pretty, pretty fucking big. Yeah, it's, it's the like garage twice the size of me. Yeah, like the garage itself. I mean, it has to be big enough to have cars in it, and then there's like an attic to the garage where there's storage and stuff. So it's it, it is pretty right. high. Uh, it's at, at the peak because it has got a pointed roof. At the peak, it's probably even higher than that. Mm. But yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, funny hats. I used to go to anime conventions uh, with a few college friends, and um, uh, one of the things I used to that that giant crown that I, I think I've worn on the podcast uh, for one of the, the Pope crowns, yeah, the Pope crown. Uh, I actually used to wear that to the anime conventions, and I used to it has a pocket inside it, and I used to always wear aviators going through and like cheap aviators. So I'd buy like a mm. twenty pack of them on Amazon, these shitty aviators, and I just fill the crown with them. And so, like, I just walk around to, and just to random people at the convention, I just, you know, they'd, they'd make a comment about the hat or something like that. I'd take it off, unzip it, hand them a pair of aviators, put it back on, and move on. Completely silent. <laughs> like, just. Oh, I fucking love that crown. Nice. Uh. Breaking something. Oh. Well, there's a Doesn't have to be you. Doesn't have to be. God, there's a really a, there's there's a lot of stuff with this. Um, come, I, I may come back to this one. I, I can't think of I can think of a couple things right off the bat, but they're kind of meh, mediocre. Okay. Uh, nightlife. Ironically, I don't. Big? I don't have too much to, to say about. No, it. I need. <laughs> it's, it's just, I'm not really a night person. I'm a morning person. Um, yeah. But let me. Oh, so this this one is not about me, um, but it is something people I knew in college did. We used to. So we went to college in a city called uh, Worcester, Central Massachusetts. It mm. it's not. Th there are bad parts of the city, but the bad parts of the city aren't really that bad. Um, Juan and one of my other uh, friends, Jotham, went on a walk through. Um, they, they decided we, they used to like just going on walks through the city, and a, a bunch of other people joined them and stuff uh, during some of these walks. And I remember one time, like one of our friends, he lived up in like you know very rural area, not used to cities, and to scare the shit out of him, they just took a random walk through like the industrial district in Worcester, and he thought they were gonna get like shanked and mugged. It's kind of funny. Um, but no, Juan and Jotham went walking one night, and they decided to just on a random summer night, and they'd been walking around campus, and Jotham had been uh, just walking barefoot, just because he's like, you mm -hmm. know, it's a nice place, I'm not, not going to like step on glass or anything like that. But then they decided to walk through the city, and he didn't go back to get shoes. And as they're walking through the city, they come across like just this random drunk dude, like outside of a, a bar or restaurant or something. Again, middle of the night, probably uh, close to midnight, and this guy's outside, and he he kind of like stumbles, and he looks at Jotham, he looks down at his feet, he's like, "Yo, man, you you ain't got no shoes on." <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just like to love drunk people for stating the obvious. <laughs> just, just like didn't know how to react to it, and they anyway they they made it back fine. He really sore feet at the end of that, but. Yeah, no shit. No issues. Uh, uh, the beach. Hmm. Sandy or pebbled. God damn it. Um, so this this one isn't necessarily like not too interesting. So one of um one of my other friends, uh, he his family has like a beach house up on up in York, Maine. And nice. it's kind of shared throughout the family, so, like, very large extended family, and so him being the, the kid, like, kind of gets the, the lowest dibs at that point on the house. 
Um, so, which usually meant he would get it in like fall when not a lot of people wanted to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. Which ironically, you know, was great. I, I don't know. I like I like the beach in fall. It's like foggy and cool, but it's still nice to go out and see the ocean and stuff. Mm. Anyway, so we'd go up there in like November or October uh, with him, like in college, just as like a on like a vacation sort of thing. And we used to just hole up and play D and D for like an entire day while we were up there, and a bunch of fun <laughs> stuff happened. Mad. But we, we, somebody was taking like we we all were walking up and down the beach, and somebody was taking photos of us like walking back, like one of our other friends. And we looked yeah. at it and like we look like the shittiest boy band ever, because <laughs> you know it's it's windswept. There's fog in the background. You get the ocean rolling in, and we're out there fully dressed. I think I was wearing denim on denim. Like, I had a, a denim, Brr. like, dress shirt and, a, and denim jeans. Oh, God. I've never had Ouch. good fashion since. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bam. Um, kids. Be it human children or baby goats. <laughs> I can't... I, the story I thought of, I can't tell on the podcast because... Um, Is it the, the Ravens... No, the, it was the one where Juan's kid was like picking through oh, my Juan's hair, kid. and his wife yelled at him because she was thinking that he oh, was making yeah, his son yeah. racist. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's a lot of those <laughs> the stories. Um, you know, what? actually, I'll tell a story about um, Juan's kid. Um, okay. So his his wife speaks Chinese, and he speaks Vietnamese, and they both speak English. So the mm. kid is growing up knowing three languages. He will deliberately use the wrong language on the wrong parent. Like, when he just feels like being cheeky, he'll speak to Juan in Chinese. Or he'll speak to, you know, Juan's wife in Vietnamese. Because he knows yeah. it'll fuck with him. I don't know if he still does it, but, like, this was pre-COVID when this happened. Um, hmm. And he used to do that just to mess with him. <laughs> that, yeah. that was when the kid was, like, two. So, who knows what kind of a beast this kid is going to be when he's older. Like, if he's already fucking yeah. with him at that age. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Meeting shenanigans. Oh, you'd like work meetings and stuff? Yeah, you don't have to mention any oh, yeah, that, that's names fine. or businesses. So I, I, the, the company I used to work for, um, we had a lot of clients. Um, so we, we did contract manufacturing <laughs> for them. Mm -hmm. And one of the project managers, like we had one client that was particularly difficult. Like nothing was ever good enough. It had to be done their way, no matter what. And it's like, no matter how inconvenient it was, and no, they're not going to pay us more for doing it the inconvenient way. And we were on a conference call with them. And the project manager, I love this guy. Um, older dude, a bit rotund, um, but just awesome dude. And like, you know, he and I worked really closely together because um, a lot of the projects that he was on, like, I had to sign off on some of the stuff because I was the um, one of the groups that actually qualified the, the processes that we were doing. And they, they were do they were being like kind of really difficult and they were they went into this long tirade about how we had to do it this way and this is why and clearly they weren't gonna be done talking for a period of time. So he reaches over to the like the conference call thing in the middle of the table, mutes it. And then just goes into just a swearing fit, just like, what the fuck are these people thinking? It's just a fucking shit. Fucking fucking shit. <laughs> and then, then they finish talking, and he unmutes it, and he's like, yeah, okay, we'll we'll, we'll look into that, and we'll see if we can uh, we can take care of it. <laughs> and then they go into talking again, spot. mutes it again, and just like, what the fuck? <laughs> I I had such a hard time not laughing in that meeting. <laughs> that guy was great. Oh, shit. Okay, uh, and for the last one today... Okay. Uh, epic moments. Oh, um... I don't know if this is... <sighs> Do I want to call or this... Or you can go back to the breaking one if you want. I... This is going to take a little bit of... Okay. I, I think I have, um, I, I have one for epic moments, and again, it's not, it's not mine. It's actually my, so my freshman year at, co at college, the mm. we you know, lived in a, a dorm, and there were three levels. Each level housed about sixty people, depending on how many people they put in doubles and triples and whatnot. Um, my, 
the the top two floors were co-ed. My floor was all guys, which meant the top mm. two floors were fairly quiet and subdued because the girls kept things in line. The bottom floor was just bedlam. <laughs> like, yeah. Absolute bedlam. Because <laughs> it's, it's 60 freshman year college age guys that are kind of on their own for the first time and crazy shit happened. I could tell so many stories from, from the stuff that happened on there. Um, Alright, I'll let you pick, because there's two I have in mind. Uh, right. Would you like one about a shopping trolley and a guitar solo, or one about a man on an epic, like, woman spree? For the pe the matter of pc maybe you should go for the uh, guitar and shopping trolley. <laughs> okay. So, there was this crazy dude that lived on our floor named uh, Anton. Genius dude. He was, like, he was going for robotics engineering as his degree, and he got in there on a scholarship, which was notoriously difficult at my school. Like, they didn't give away financial aid, you know, like, you had to really be good at something. Yeah. Um, extremely intelligent dude. Uh, he also had a fucking epic name, but I won't say the whole thing on here just because, you know. Yeah, don't dox. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway... He'd also do, like, some really crazy things. He, um... He used to take his roommate's Adderall so he could study better. He didn't have ADHD. But... Anyway. Um... Yeah. So, we used to... There was a, uh, like, a, a shop, uh, like, a shopping center near the school, and people used to steal their shopping trolleys. Shopping carts, for those in the U.S. Mm. Um... And... They, they put locks on them, but what they found was that locks, that the auto lock thing when they go outside of the parking lot really doesn't work so well when you're next to a giant engineering college and pretty much everyone there is qualified not only to disable them, but to disassemble them. So yeah. we, we had a couple on our floor and one time, like one of the girls from the upper floor was uh, downstairs and I like, I was sitting in my room and I, I, I start hearing like, you know, acoustic guitar, like just really well played acoustic guitar and I just I look out my door and past comes Anton in the shopping cart just kind of lounging legs up just playing the acoustic guitar as one of the girls is just pushing him around the floor and he did a few laps like I kept hearing the music fading in and out as he's going around the floor <laughs> oh man that's oh. fucking style but yeah that is a, that is that, that's one of the more tame stories from those days yeah, God. Oh, man. Man, speaking of that kind of, um, you know, from flats, people sharing music, mm. um, I was literally just going down to the bus stop the other day, someone had opened their windows, put speakers on it, and they had like a, like a DJ set up in their room, and they were just playing for the whole high street, it was kind of weird. Yeah, God, that's awesome. I mean, it's it's mm. kind of cool, I mean, unless, you know, somebody doesn't like the music. Yeah, I mean, the music wasn't brilliant, but you know what, it's it's music, it was something. Yeah. Fun it Oh, alright. That was fun. Oh, God, I haven't thought about some of those stories in a while. <laughs> alright. Well, that's it. We actually kept it to a reasonable time today. So. Yep. This is going to be the end of episode 49 of the TMCJ podcast. Thank you all for listening, and you will hear us again next week. See you then.